good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord on this day, and so glad to be here. This is the day we kick off the new church year. Church, you know, I know the new year starts on January one. New church year starts September one, and so we're kicking that. We kick that off today, and so glad you're able to be here. Um, we'll mention to you some announcements and some things going on, and. Um, you know, remind you some things again. This being Labor Day uh, weekend, I know that um, you know, maybe tomorrow you'll be able to enjoy time with your family or something, and uh, or today even. Uh, I certainly want to um, think about that. But next, this coming weekend, I believe it's on um, on Friday. We have girls that will be leaving to go to the girls' day out, and um, and so I know that Sister Kathy and them are certainly. They've got those girls um, really excited to do that. And, um, but then on next Sunday afternoon, we're going to have a, a great opportunity. Um, if you would like to go, we're going to um, um, if, if, uh, be going to take the group, whoever would like to go to Mark Tree Church of God, where Don Stiles is going to be doing service at night. And Don's been here before. Don is a great, wonderful um, singer, uh, worshiper. Um, he, share, he is one of the singers that I have seen throughout the years. He shares the gospel in preached form through his songs. Um, and every song that he'll do are songs that he's written. In fact, one of, one of Don's songs that he wrote years ago, right before we got a chance to be his pastor, um, this past year was elected as number one um, um, Southern Gospel Song of the Year. And it is... Uh, one of my all-time favorites. I know he'll sing it. If he don't, I'll make him sing it. Uh, it's called Just Like That. And um, what, a, what a great song. But you, if you want to go to that, um, we'll have a sign-up sheet um, out for next Sunday morning. And we're going to leave to go about 3.30 that afternoon to, to head over to Mark Tree. It's a 5 o'clock service. We'll be back in plenty of time. We um, won't be late. And, and um, just want to give you a little advance, you know, there probably won't be any eating afterwards because if you've been to Mark Tree, then you understand, okay? Um, they do have a McDonald's, but that's that's about it. And so, uh, but we're, we'll have a great time. We'd love for you to be able to go. We can, we'll take the van or the bus, whatever we need to take. Uh, but I think you'll enjoy that. And again, I know that just um, in just a few weeks, we're going to be having opportunity for those who want to go to the Senior Adult Day at the Velvet Ridge Church. And I know some people um, don't want to admit and don't want to um, face being senior citizens, but um, they're, they're going to have a great time with that. And, and we want you to be able to go to that. And you know what? It is a blessing to be a senior citizen. I said it's a blessing to be a senior citizen. You know, don't fight it. Don't fight it. Be blessed by it. You get a discount when you go eat. And, um, and the Bible has great blessings that are bestowed on and that. And every year you're given is a blessing. So, uh, so if you happen to be a senior citizen, um, you know, first of all, you are the largest demographic in our whole country. Um, don't let everybody tell you any different. You are the largest demographic in all of this country. And so, so you outnumber everybody else. Okay? And so, um, so um, if you want to go to that, you're going to be in for a treat. It is going to be a fantastic, wonderful time that's going to be on that day. I'm excited to be able to go. I'm excited to be able to go um, because Brother Higgins is going to be sharing the word, and we love Brother Higgins here. Um, such a great thing. Again, to remind you that, again, we're, we do our prayer needs. Um, write them down. Before you leave, um, come take a picture of this. But as we begin, um, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. Brother Jerry, would you come up here? Um, we're going to begin, uh, and this year we're going to be opening up different people who are going to lead us as we begin in prayer, each service. So I want you to stand to your feet, and, um, and, 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 and how many of you believe in prayer? That prayer changes things, that God will touch your needs, and that, that God will minister um, to your needs. And, and so um, Brother Jerry's going to lead us in prayer as we start, as we start off this service. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, for this time for fellowship together. Lord, all these names that are already on the list, we thank pray to God that you would touch each and every one of them. All these that are out there this morning that may have a need that didn't write it down, we pray that, Lord, that you would bless them. Lord, that you would touch each and every one that is here this morning, and we give you all the praise. 
in Jesus' precious name. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. We can go ahead and smile. We can go ahead and laugh. We can enjoy ourselves. 
But you know, now it's time to enjoy ourselves in giving. This is the first service of our of our church here, and we want to give our very best. Let's kick off the 2023-2024 church year by giving our very best. I know it's Labor Day weekend, but we can do our best on Labor Day, can't we? We can do our best on this weekend. You can look at somebody and say, you know what? I can do my best today. I can do my best. Go ahead. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to bring our tithe and to bring our offering to you. Lord, we are privileged to get to worship you in our giving. Thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, bless these givers. Amen. Worship the Lord with your giving. There's honey in the rock, water in the snow, meadow on the ground, no matter where I go.
and she's still my aunt, you know. Uh, and so, uh, so Fort Benning, so I don't know if they'll come back to life or anything like that. He, it was after Vietnam, and so, uh, but, but um, that's how I got my Aunt Evie uh, at Fort Benning. But we want to pray for these guys in just a few moments, and we we're going to do this at the end, and and, um, and I, I know these guys, now they look different than they did in some of these pictures you see up there. In fact, they don't have near as much hair as they used to have, and they won't have hair for a while. These fellows won't have hair for a while. I kind of like the new look too, by the way. I do like that new look. And so, because it makes you look a lot older, don't it? Um, but we want to pray for them, but I also want to, as we pray for these young guys, we want to pray several things over them before they go off boot camp. Well, I want to pray for God's protection on them. Amen. They are going to be in the military. And when they, after they come back, I think it's like six months or eight months or something like that, when they, they, they'll be in the National Guard and they'll be going each month. But you know what? They can always get called up. That, that, that happens. And, and when you serve, you serve. We thank God for that. And I thank God for every one of these that served for us and, 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 and for this country. And I, and I think that there's, I, there's a great blessing to be in the army. My uncle went in the army in Vietnam, and he went in as a foot soldier private. And when he came out and he retired in 1999, he was a full bird colonel. He could fly anything that had wings or had blades on it, and he could fly them all. And he, um, he was a war hero just from right here in Mississippi County. And so we don't want you to have to be war heroes. You're already heroes to us. And so... Uh, we want you to be protected, but we want to pray for God's protection on you. We also want to pray for strength because it does take some, it takes a lot of endurance and things that you're going to go through and, 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 and so forth. And, and we want to pray God give you strength, and I know he will do that. We also want to pray for boldness. Now, I'm not talking about the boldness that you need as military guys. I want to pray that God would give you boldness to never forget Jesus while you're in the military. Okay? Don't let no amount of things that people say to you or anything. I had a young man I used to pastor years ago. And I would love to have this call. And these boys had my number. I, he went um, right after 9-11. He joined the Marines and went to serve there. And he went to, um, he went to um, Fort Le, uh, Camp Lejeune uh, for, for his boot camp. And I remember when he went, uh, or not for boot camp, that's where he was stationed after boot camp. His mama was so concerned. His name's BJ. His mama was so concerned that he wouldn't be in church. And his first Sunday that he was at Camp Lejeune, he didn't call his mama. He called me. He said, Brother Danny, he said, I'm at, he found the Church of God right outside of Camp Lejeune. And, and that's in North Carolina. He, said, he calls, he says, Brother Danny, he says, I know mama's not at church. I wanted to call you because you're my pastor. He said, Would you tell mama I'm at church? I'm at a Church of God. And, um, and I got to tell his mama, Sister Shirley, I said, I said, Shirley, I said, BJ is at church this morning. His first day at that, or his first Sunday at that camp. If I get that call that I can share with your family when you have a Sunday off, there'll be churches and they'll have great chaplains. And, um, and so we want you to have the boldness that you carry Jesus Christ because your family is giving you this. But not only that, um, I know I've, I've had conversations over the last six or eight months with Sister Barbara, and she's a grandma. And you got to understand the reason a lot of these boys and some of them come to church is because for years there were dinners that said, you're going to have dinner after Little Road Church of God. Um, anybody I remember that? And so, and she's a grandma. She don't like seeing her boys go away. All right, no grandma likes to see that. And it's hurting her. We're going to pray for Peter. I know his mama hurts too, and grandpa hurts too. And, but you know what? We're going to, would y'all help pray for peace for them? Yeah. For this grandma and mama and dad and grandpa and, and family. And these boys aren't doing this to hurt them. They're doing this because they, they want to do this to become men and so forth. And we want to support them in that. Yeah. But at the same time, we want to pray for them. And so I want to encourage you to be sure and encourage Barbara Lynn, be sure to encourage Ricky, and be sure to encourage Sister Barbara, because there are going to be times that they're not going to get to hear from these boys because they're going to be running five, ten miles or whatever and doing the things that they have to do. Okay? Would you help do that? So I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet.
And I remember the pictures that were up there where I looked right there when they got baptized. I remember the pain when I remember when these boys got baptized. Would you stretch your hands toward these young men? And we're going to pray for them and ask God's blessing. God, as I lay hands right now, God, I lay hands on Christian and Caleb, dear God. They, these boys, dear God, for years we've watched them, dear God, grow up. We've watched them play basketball. We've watched them um, grow up into young men. We've seen them, dear God, go through all these different things that young men go through. But Lord, I know that you're going to be with them, dear God. And we pray for protection, dear God, over them. Lord, we thank you for the young men and women who serve in our military. We thank you for these young men, dear God. And Lord, I know, dear God, it's not easy, but I know that you're going to be with them. God, I pray for their protection. I pray for their strength, dear God. Give them the physical strength and the emotional strength to do it. And when they have days they feel like they can't do it, just give them more strength. And God, I pray, dear God, that you would give them boldness. Boldness to say, you know what? I love Jesus. Love God. And I'm going to serve him even while I'm in the military. And Lord, I pray that you would do that for these young men, dear God, and use them in that way. And God, I pray right now, dear Lord, I also pray, dear God, for their mama and their grandmama and their grandpa and their family that's going to miss them. Give them peace about it, dear God. Let them know that they're not walking by themselves, dear God. In the name of Jesus. We bless them. Amen. 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 You know, we also, I have a little thing here. Um, a military Bible that they have. And I think that their grandma may have put something in there for them to go with it as well. When I look in there. Always, oh, not the Bible's not the only thing that's green there, folks. I think she put some green stuff in there as well for you guys to have so you can buy you some Twizzlers or something like that. All right? You're going to do great. You're going to do great. Let's give these boys a hand. They're going to represent well. And remember, when you're over there, you always represent Steph Curry. They don't like Steph Curry. I just like to tease them. You can be seated. They're LeBron James fans, folks, okay? Uh, they are. I want to share with you a word this morning. I want to share with you a word. The Lord began dealing with me several weeks ago about this, and, and last week we had a revival Sunday. What a powerful day we had last week. Um, Noah did such a great job. I, did you, I, if you were here, you got to hear that testimony. What a powerful testimony it was with Noah um, always being in his dad and him. Um, what a powerful time we had last Sunday evening in that. And that was a revival Sunday. God laid on our hearts with that. And we talked about revival. And the Lord laid on my heart to start with that. And then for this month, we're going to minister about revival all month. And then the beginning of October, we're going to have a revival Sunday. You see, God strategically placed these things on my heart for a reason. Because there is a fundamental need that the church has right now, and that's revival. That is revival. Revival is not just a few meetings and things like that. Those are incredibly important I texted Brother Owens me today. I just had to, I had to listen to that song he did Sunday night on Born Again. I had to listen to it again this, this morning a couple of times. I, it may have been an old-fashioned song, but it, it, it hit me, and it's a, it is a powerful thing, and, and, and it encouraged me about the need for people to be born again, about the need for the Holy Spirit operating in our lives, and we need that. And I needed that as a pastor, you see, because I understand what it's like to be revived and the need to be revived. It's something that we all need, but... We find that Jesus gives us an intentional message, and an intentional message, Brother Ron, is given to the church. And this intentional message is given to the church, and it begins, the book of Revelation, the second chapter, begins the message of revival to the church. He said, the, the, the Revelation is about the end times. Revelation begins talking to the church. And the church it's going to be around in the last days is what it's talking to. It gives us examples of other churches. In Revelation chapter 2, it starts off 
with the church of Ephesus. And I want to, this whole month, we're going to talk just a little bit about this church, Ephesus, but then we're going to talk about this church and what we need. So if you'll, if you'll bear with me as we look at it, I want to just read some scriptures to you beginning in verse 1. It says, the angel of the church of Ephesus Write these things, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works. What a great thing he says. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you've tested those who say they are apostles and are not and found them liars. In fact, he tells right there, he says, I know the good things that God has done in you. I know the good things that God has done in you at Ephesus. And that's what he says. And he goes on. He says, and you persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. I mean, God tells us here. Jesus is telling us in the, in, in the book of Revelation here about the importance of the things you've done. In fact, Jesus honors what you've done. God always remembers what you've done. Hallelujah. And he'll honor that. But then he says this. Because Jesus is always trying to help us get better. And that's an important aspect. He's always trying to help us get better. And he says this to us. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you. Now, it's not when he says I have it against you. It's not that he's mad. He said, I've got something that you've got to improve at. Would we all agree that there are things in our spiritual walk that we can improve on. After 35 years as a Christian, as a believer, I know that there are things that I need to improve on. And he said this. He says, this is what I have against you. He says, you've left your first love. You've left your first love. And, and, and all of that to me is one of the, the most challenging scriptures in the Bible. You've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I'll come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Who, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word that you have spoken. And let us have ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Let revival come. Let revival come. And again, over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about this. We've heard the term revival, the importance of revival. And, and, and what we have to understand is revival is not a singular event. You see, we, we put it as a singular event, but rather revival is a process that starts inside a person and inside a group of believers. That's what revival is. It is a process. The word revival simply means a coming Back to life again. That's what it means. It, it describes a spiritual awakening, a restoration, a spiritual passion, a renewal of faith, a returning to God. A revival is more than emotionalism. And, and don't get me wrong, we get emotional when we have real revival in our life. But we're not led by the emotions of this thing. We're led by the spiritual phenomenon of, of coming back alive again. That's what we're to be led by. And one of the biggest misconceptions about revival is that revival is only needed by those who backslid. It's not just the case, you see. A lot of times I think, because we're here every Sunday, we think, oh, revival is only needed by those who weren't here on Sunday. Nothing can be farther from the truth. The reality is, revival is for sure needed by those of us who've been here every Sunday. Those of us who are who, who, who've been through the, the, the battles of our Christian walk. And those of us who are bruised and battered through the different things that we face in life. That revival is needed by every believer. Go ahead and clap your hands. We all need C 
seasons of spiritual renewal. We all need seasons of spiritual revival. We all need to have the reign of the Holy Spirit on our life. We need the reign of the Holy Spirit in the church again. In the Spirit to be poured out. We need to be refreshed and we need to be renewed. So our prayer for revival, it's not an indictment of, of the church. It's not an indictment of us individually. It's not an indictment of corporate things. But rather it's a recognition that we all need God. You see, people get offended sometimes. You say, well, we need revival. We need to be revived. Don't be offended when I say we need to be revived because I need to be revived. It's not an indictment. It's a recognition that we need God. That's what it is. And it's important for us to understand that. In other words, the church, need, the world doesn't need revival. Because the world can't be revived. The world needs to be saved. It's the church that needs revival. Jesus in Revelation 2 was not talking to the world. He was talking to the church. As you read all through the seven churches, he does not mention the world, but he mentions the church. He mentions the people who are safe because we're the ones that he's trying to lift up so that we can be what we're supposed to be to the world. The revival is both personal and it's corporate. So it starts in the, with individual, but it also has to be corporate. In other words, I need revival, but we need revival. Everybody say, I. I. And everybody say, we. That's the individual and that's the corporate thing we need. You see, throughout Scripture, we hear a stream of prayers for revival. In Psalm chapter 51, the psalmist David declares to everybody, he says, Create in me, restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. And, you know, it's, the reality is, sometimes, even after we've been saved a long time, we need to have the joy of our salvation restored. I don't always feel like I felt 35 years ago. I don't always feel like I felt last week. He says, when I'm revived, then I'll teach transgressors. The reason the church isn't winning people is because we're not in a place that we can teach the lost until we get revived. Come on, man. Look at the He says, in, in Psalm 85, he says, will you not revive us? When? So if he says, and will you not revive us again? That means it has to happen over and over and over and over. In other words, I need to be revived again and again and again. The longer you stay with God, the more you're going to have to be revived, folks. Hmm. Isaiah said, for I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessings on your offspring. What a great, powerful thing. Do we want God's spirit to be poured out on us? Absolutely we do. In Joel chapter 2 and in Acts chapter 3, he talks about God's spirit being poured out. We find that's what revival is. What is revival? It was a revival then when Samuel inter interceded at Mitzvah. Uh, when Elijah prevailed at Mount Carmel, when Hezekiah called the nation to repentance in 2 Chronicles, when Ezra proclaimed the word, when John the Baptist announced the Messiah, when the Jesus ushered in the kingdom of God, when the Spirit came at Pentecost, and when the martyred church stood firm under the persecution of Rome, that is when revival has taken place over and over and over. The church has shown time and time again that it needs revival. Well, in 2023, we need revival. Let revival come. Somebody say that. The Reformation that brought about the that brought about the Protestant Church was born under men like John Wycliffe, Martin Luther, and John Calvin. The first great awakening came in the 1700s with John and Charles Wesley in England. The Puritans and Anglicans founded Harvard and Yale to educate ministers. 
Jonathan Edwards, he led a revival in Massachusetts. George Whitfield began preaching tours in the U.S. David Bringer took revival to the, to the American Indians, the Native Americans, and the African Americans and gave his life for it. The Second Great Awakening came in the 1800s with men like William Carey, David Livingstone, Dr. D.L. Moody, and Charles Finney. Oh, the revival came in the 1900s when we had, in the early 1900s, we, 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 we had the, the, the outpouring that took place at Azusa Street in Los Angeles, which was 10 years after the outpouring at Cabin Creek on the North Carolina, Tennessee border that began the Church of God. Billy Graham, his evangelistic crusades that spread the gospel throughout the world. Reinhardt Bucky, who literally won millions and millions to the Lord and on the continent after over 75 million and people came to the Lord during those revivals. The charismatic renewal broke through the denominational barriers. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., because of revival, led the civil rights movement and brought about social justice. The modern church growth movement and even the seeker citizen movement opened the door of the kingdom. And I've come to tell you that in the 2000s, we need revival again. We need re revival now. I don't care if all the lights are on or if smoke machines are and they're shutting the lights off. It doesn't matter. We need revival. Let revival come. Those past revivals are great. Those past revivals prove to us the reality of revival. Yes. But they do us no good today. I can't be content with yesterday's manna. Remember the children of Israel, when they're eating in the wilderness, they could only get enough manna for one day, except for the Sabbath. They would have manna for two days, the day before the Sabbath, but they could only get enough manna. In other words, they could only survive one day at a time. And as the church, well, I can't survive off of what God did for me in 1988. I've got to have God do something in my life. I have to have revival in 2023. I can't survive off of what happened in 1992. I can't survive off of what happened in 1993 when God called me to preach. I've got to have God do something now in my life. You've got to have God do something. Don't go back and look and thank God for, oh, just what He did in 1950. It's not the same as it was in 1955. No, it's not the same now. But God is the same. God doesn't change. And if you're not receiving something, it's not anybody's fault but your own. Oh, I'm preaching better than you're shouting right now. Because that's the absolute 100% truth of God. I hear too many people talk about the good old days. The good old days are gone. We've got the days that God has given us. And we can either serve God now or we can just give up. You don't want to go back to the day when they don't have air conditioning in the church. Go you know, back to the day where they had one pot belly stove in church during the dead of winter. And if you didn't get by that, you were going to be frozen. You want to go back to that? Of course not. Then we can't go back to the 1950s. We can't go back to the 1960s. We've got to have God today. And we've got to have it today. That was the problem that the church of Ephesus on the one hand, Ephesus, the Bible says they were a great church. Christ commended them. He said, look at the works you've done. Look at the things. You, 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 you represent holiness. You preserve the holiness. And he said, in fact, you don't tolerate the wickedness of society today. And that was a wonderful thing. Oh, and, and, and preachers came into that church and they weren't preaching the truth. They sent them out. They didn't tolerate it. They didn't tolerate doctrinal error. They didn't tolerate it. They found things to be false. They didn't placate to it. They sent it out. He said, that's a good thing. They 
were steadfast. Well, what does it mean to be steadfast? They were strong. They stayed with their faith. Yet, these people, Jesus said, still needed revival. They still needed revival. And here's what we find. What would bring them to revival? And it's just simple things. You see, God doesn't make it hard for us. Jesus says, here's the real issue. You've got all these good works. You've done all these good things. But here's the real issue. The reason you need revival. You've left your first love. Here's where we will have revival is a return to love. Everybody say love. A return to love. We've got to have a rekindling of our love for God. You see, it's normal. Every relationship, every relationship is cyclical. Our relationship with people are cyclical. Our relationship with family is cyclical. Our relationship with other, other folks is cyclical. Our relationship with God has cycles in it. It really is like that. You know, um, and, and, and Jesus looks at him, he says, he says, looks at the church, he says, you've left your first love. He says, you've abandoned, you've forsaken your first love. Who was their first love? Their first love was God. They had came to God in the midst of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. As the Apostle Paul was taking the gospel all over on his missionary journeys, they had come to God and, and they loved God so much. And then how many of you remember when you when you got saved, when you got saved, oh man, you loved God so much, you could you could fight any devil. You were going to be bold. You were going to tell everybody at work. You were going to tell everybody at school. You were going to tell everybody about it. And, and you, you love him so much. You know, God, I love you. I just you know, all you think are God, 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 God. And then somewhere down the road, you get busy doing, and I know there's something. I've been a pastor for 25 years. I understand what it's like to go through the motions. We all do. Don't look at me like that. Don't look at me like I'm the only hypocrite around because I'm not. I understand what it's like to go through the emotion, the emotions, and, and even the emotion of the thing. And I understand what it's like to get down on my knees and pray and feel like my prayers aren't getting past the ceiling. I understand what those things are like. And even in me, he, he says, he didn't say you backslid. He didn't tell the Ephesians they back. He said, you left your first love. How many in here are married? You know, being married is a beautiful thing. Come up here, honey. Come on, come on. Get up and go fast. People have some food on at the house and waiting for their food to get ready. <laughs> they wait and they go to Greece and a little wine. But, uh, <laughs> all right. Man, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm going to embarrass you for anything. In 1988, in August, I got saved. And nine days, Jacob, after I got saved, she said, yeah, I will date you. And so she started dating me. It was the best thing that ever happened to her. And I, so good. So good. I mean, and, you know, she, she looked at me. She, she said, I'm ready, to, I'm ready to start dating you. And I thought, oh, man, I'm so glad. And, and, and then, you know, we fell in love. And, 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 and it took a while. I remember when I first, I, I told her I loved her right off the bat. I mean, it didn't take me long to tell her I loved her. And I said, I, said, I love you. And, 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 and she always, she's the one I always had a response. She says, and I, you. <laughs> she couldn't get her out and say, I love you, but she said, and I, you. And finally, a few months later, right, we got lost in Memphis. I was taking her doctor, and we had our first fight. Anybody remember ever having your first fight with that one you love? You're going to have a fight. You're going to fuss. You're going to argue. And, and when we finally got, when I finally got her to where she's supposed to be, she looked at me, and she said, I love you. And I said, and I you. <laughs> now, we've been married 33 years. And not all those 33 years, there have been times, folks, we've always been together. But there have been times where we loved each other. And I know she loved me more than she liked me. I mean, there have been times, it's real. Probably right now, she's sitting there thinking, I'm going to get him home and I'm going 
let him have it. It wouldn't be the first time. Man, there are times that, 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 that we've got in fusses and arguments before church that I don't know how she got up and played the piano or how I got up and preached. And those are some of the best services we've ever been a part of because we were able to out-hypocrite everybody else that day. I mean, we were. I mean, then we had those things. There are times where you love that person, but you feel like you left your first love. But you know what's great? After 33 years of marriage, I also have learned how that my, our love gets rekindled. And it has to be worked on. And that's with our marriage. God understands that because it's a marriage with an extent. Uh, God, God, we have to have rekindle our love for God. And God understands that sometimes we don't love Him like we used to. He always loves us, but it was something. And, and we have to understand, we have to go back and focus on our love for God. But here's the thing when our love for God starts to diminish, our love for others starts to diminish. And the first thing that happens when you stop loving God like you should, you start getting impatient and disgusted with people. The only way to get back to loving people is to get back on your knees and love God again. That's what you've got to do. It's intertwined there. Wilson Carlisle, the founder of the Christian Army, he said, Jesus captured my heart. For me to know Jesus is a love affair. And that's what we're calling on today. The greatest mark of revival is rekindling our love for God. When you get your love for God in place, you'll have your love for others in place. That's the first thing. The second thing if we're going to have revival, is not only rekindling of our love for God, a true need for the Holy Spirit's power. Verse 5 says this, remember the height from which you've fallen. You know what he's telling us? That we need the refreshing of the Holy Ghost again. We need the refreshing of the Holy Spirit's power. The Holy Spirit is not confined to the church house. And it's not confined, confined to a denomination. It's not confined to anything because the Holy Spirit, He is there all the time. And sometimes we're not experiencing the Holy Spirit's power, not because He's not there, but because we just aren't seeking the power of the Holy Ghost. You understand, my friend? We've got to have not just an Acts 2 experience. We need to have an Acts 2 experience again and again and again and again. I mean, what does it mean? It means He is recalling us to that place where we remember our beginning point. My beginning point is when He poured out His Spirit on me. Anybody remember when He poured out His Spirit on you? Anybody remember when you got saved? And he, he, you, know, you didn't get saved without the Holy Spirit was the one that was calling you. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't get filled unless the Holy Spirit filled you. You understand that? That's the, the power of the Holy Ghost in our life. When the power of the Holy Ghost, He will not leave. He is not going anywhere. Sometimes it's us that's left Him. E. Stanley Jones said the Holy Spirit has been lost in large measure from modern Christianity. We are presenting a Holy Spiritless Christianity. A demand without a dynamic. But you understand the Holy Spirit hadn't lost any bit of His power. And He hadn't lost any bit of His authority. And here I come to tell you today that we need the Holy Spirit operating in our lives Daily, not just on Sunday in the altar, but when you get up from this altar, you need to walk around with the power of the Holy Spirit daily in your life. I'm not Pentecostal just on Sunday. I'm Pentecostal every day of my life. 
Because the Holy Spirit is more than just a name. The Holy Spirit is part of my day to day. It is the, the, the Pentecostal experience in the believers it is, is, a, is an experience that's not just a one time thing. It is an all the time thing. You know what I go back to Ezekiel chapter 37. If you get a chance go and read those first 10 verses of that chapter. And in Ezekiel 37 we find the vision of the, dry, of the valley of the dry bones when he prophesied to the wind. What is that when he prophesied of the wind that was the Holy Spirit that he was prophesying for and you know what sometimes we're like those dry bones don't look at me like that sometimes I feel like I'm dry bones that I need him to prophesy to the wind so that I can have my dry bones filled again and I can get up like that army of God and get up and serve him and see what God will do and yeah you may be in the valley of dry bones today but when the Holy Spirit Spirit breathes on you. You won't be dry anymore. You won't be up under the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Somebody ought to praise Him right now. And if you feel like you've been in a dry place, you ought to stand up on your feet and say, today I'm coming out of dry places. I am coming out of that. And I'm going to walk under the power of God. When the Spirit blows the wind of Pentecost in the church, we can stand up like the army that God has called us to be. And the Bible tells us this, that the gates of hell shall not prevail. If the gates of hell have been prevailing, it's because you're not walking with the power of God. But I've come to prophesy to somebody today that you've been walking in dryness. Today, God's going to begin the process of reviving you. Well, somebody needs to be receiving that right now. The process of reviving you, and as He revives you, you're not going to be what you were 10 years ago. You're not going to be what you were 20 years ago. You're not going to be what you were 30 years ago. When God revives you, He's going to do greater things in your near future than He ever did in your past. I'm not looking for an experience that I had 35 years ago. I'm not looking, Brother Mike, for an experience I had 30 years ago. I'm looking for a new experience today. Come to the music, please. I've got to hurry up and finish this. Because I feel like the need to pray for some folks in just a minute. He goes on and he tells us this. If you want revival, you got to have a return. To the basics. God didn't make this so hard that it couldn't happen for you. We act like, well, if I had just a little magical experience, we've been watching too many movies on the sci fi channel. We've been watching too many superhero movies thinking that God, that we got that, that, that we gotta have Captain America come save us. Listen to me, my friend. This is not a make-believe story. This, this, this is not a comic book life. This is getting back to the basics with God. We got to get back to the basics. Here's what he said. You want to have revival in your life? Repent. Do the things you did at first. When I want to have a revival in my marriage, you know what I do? Brother Roger, I go back to my wife and I ask her out again. I said, Would you like to go on a date night? If you want to go on a date night? We'll go to the finest restaurant. We'll go to, well, I, I'll go take you. He said, when, 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 when I want to take her on a date night, I'm not taking her to Zaxby's. I'm not taking her to Sonic. I ain't taking her to Grecian for sure. I'm not taking her to, well, I, I'm, I'm going to take her someplace that I know she likes. I'll say, where do you want to go? 
And I used to back years ago. Sister Connie, she had taste that was a little higher than now. You know, we, we lived in Mary and she said, I want to go to Ruth's Chris. I'm glad she only goes to go once a year there. And we, we, we would, I would take her to a place like Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. I wouldn't like steak, but I'd take her because I knew she liked it. And it was worth it. I mean, it, it was worth it. You see, a place like that, you don't get a meal. You get to pay for everything, what they call a la carte. You might know what a la carte means. That means that you, you buy your steak, you buy your potatoes, you buy your salad. You don't even get Reese Tills on your Cokes. They bring you a Coke, and then you pay for another Coke. But, that's what she wanted. I'm taking her someplace like that. Now she likes to go to a place called Texas Roadhouse. She loves Texas Roadhouse. I, I, you want to go to Texas Roadhouse? And I'll make sure, I'll say, look, let's make sure none of the kids try to sidle in on this thing, just me and her. And we'll go to Texas Roadhouse. And then we might go to a movie. And, 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 and something like that. We'll have a date night. And then you know what I'll do? I'll tell her, I love you. You know what? She don't look at me and say anymore, and I use she says, I love you. And that rekindles our love toward each other. You do the basics. Right here, Jesus said, all you've got to do, do what you did at first again. Do what you did at first. What did you do when you first loved God? You fell on your face before Him and you said, God, I'm giving you myself. You can have every part of me. And if you truly want revival, you'll fall on your face again and say, God, I give you all of myself again. That's the heart of revival. Love God. The realizing we need the Holy Spirit. Going back and doing our first things. Would you stand to your feet? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus right now, I thank you, dear God, that you're a God that revives us. That you're a God that revives us. this to a church that backslid. He said this to a church that just needed to be revived. You know what? That's the call. I, I want everybody to hear this. Listen to me. And this is where the Lord is speaking so solemnly in my spirit. This is what he's saying. If you have a need, and how many of you have a need from God? Hold up. You have a need from Him here. I want you to hear me. God loves to touch your needs. I don't care whether it's a healing, whether it's a family situation, whatever it may be. I don't, doesn't matter. Finances, God loves to touch your needs. But here's what he's saying. He says, don't talk to me about your need yet. Before you get your miracle, give yourself to me again. Do your first works. He's not even saying the reason you have a need is because of that. That's not what he's saying. But what he's saying before, before, he says, I want you to really pursue me. I want you. He said, I'm the one that came after you before you can say, now I want you just to pursue me a little bit. And I'm reminding you today. What we need is this. I want to ask you for just a moment. Just a moment. If I would love for you to do this. If you feel compelled and you come to the altar, I want you just to take a few moments and fall on your face before him. We'll pray for your needs in just a few minutes. In fact, I want to pray for some people's dynamic needs, but 
I want if you can come and find a place and just talk to God and begin to repent and do your first works and call and say, God, I need to be revived. I want to give myself to you fully again. I want, I want, I, I don't want just a feeling I want to give myself fully. If, you, if you're not able to come down here, if you'll bend down on your knees and and, 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 and pray in your pew. Um, just take a few moments and say, God, I'm giving it to you. Would you do that right now? Would you just right now come on, find your place and call on God? But there's nothing like calling on Him. There's nothing like that personal time. And in a few minutes, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for your needs. We're going to call on you. I, as your pastor, I'm, I've been calling on God, asking God, God, I won't receive your Bible like never before. I hunger for your Holy Spirit like never before. And, and, and just see what God may say, Pastor, I, I, I don't know exactly what I need, but I do know this is something we need. I do know that God's a God of restoration. God's a God of blessing. God's a God of power. And He will touch you like you. Not like you were touched 20 years ago, but like you've never been touched. God doesn't just take us back to where we were. He's going to take us beyond that. Right now, just begin to call on God.